meeting of 2016. This is the organizational meeting for the Cape Elizabeth School Board. The school board met in caucus in December to present its slate of officers, and so I will call for nominations for the office of chair. I would love to nominate Elizabeth Seifries as chair of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. I would love to second it. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none. Is there any discussion? Um, I would just quickly like to say how much I appreciate um, Elizabeth's kindness and passion and talents that I'm sure she will bring to the role as school board chair. And to publicly announce that my phone is always on speed dial should you ever have a question. Thank you for your willingness to serve. I'd like also to also like to say thank you, um, and I know you will do an amazing job, and I, I can't help but think maybe that year gap is going to make you even a more um, thoughtful um, chair for our school board. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? I'll just add, add, add one additional comment, which is we uh, really appreciate you deciding to take this uh, run for chair. The effort and the diligence that you've shown far, so far to date, I think, may go unappreciated with what a large job being board chair is, and you've done a fantastic job so far to date and look forward to uh, the year with you as chair. Yes. Yes. Okay. I would just like to say um, thank you, Elizabeth. I think you're going to be an amazing leader for this board. Uh, you're thoughtful, you're considerate, you're open-minded, and um, I just expect us to do great things with you as the head of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I first start by thanking Joanna for her year, too. It's a, it's a huge job, um, and, and watching her, I know you know fully the large shoes you're stepping into, so thank you very much. See no further discussion. All those in favor? Motion carries, 7-0. And with that, Cypress, I present you the gavel. Congratulations, <laughs> Elizabeth. Thank you. And I will just note that after we maybe take this next agenda item that we should back up to and do the Pledge of Allegiance and yep. introduce everyone up here because we have some new things. So item 1B on the agenda, do I have a motion? Um, I move that we um, elect Suzanne Mazel Hubs as our school board vice chair. Second. Discussion? Um, yes, I would like to uh, say I think uh, Susanna uh, brings uh, a lot of qualities to the school board. Uh, she's very uh, thoughtful, uh, kind, but also has a ability to look at a lot of issues from uh, different perspectives. Uh, has great creativity and um, I think you're going to do a, a great job so thank you. thank you I too would like to just express my great gratitude for you taking that role and I have all the confidence in the world that you will serve the office well thank you thank you I'd like to add that Susanna is beginning her third year on the board and has contributed greatly by being on a variety of committees including paths innovation and policy with your variety of experience and your level head and your desire to improve communication you're the perfect person to help guide the work of the board this coming year so I thank you all those in favor okay. so now I think we should, should we stop and do the pledge so could we all please rise? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and I God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving over. If we could just acknowledge, maybe that we're going to kind of go along and have people just introduce themselves, or take that either way. But I know there are some new faces on the board tonight, and not everyone may recognize yeah, those faces. That sounds great. Let's do that. Would you mind starting at the end, Ms. Altenberg? Sure. My name's Heather Altenberg. It's my first year. Welcome. Thank you. 
You all know who I am. Well, but you could still say your name. Okay. I'm Joe Morrissey. I'm the outgoing chair, um, and this will be my fourth, fifth year on the board. Um, <clears throat> Michael Moore, as you can uh, read, this will be my uh, sixth year on the board. Meredith Nato, superintendent. Elizabeth Seifries, lucky incoming chair, and this is actually the beginning of my fourth, but not consecutive year on the board. Susanna Mzell Hubs, and this is the beginning of my third year on the board. Barbara Powers, this is the beginning of my second year on the board. I'm John Voltz, and I'm new to the school board this year. I'm Natalie Vaughn, and I'm the student representative. And this is my second year. Thank and you. At a basketball game at present, Ed Montana is Montana Braxton. Braxton. Not here. It's our other student <laughs> representative. So moving on, item 1C of our agenda tonight. Do I have a motion? Uh, yes. I, <clears throat> I'll do these together. I, I move that we uh, elect uh, Joanne Morsey as the finance chair, and the full board would also be a member of the finance committee. And as policy chair, uh, Barbara Powers with Heather Altenberg and John Volz as policy committee members. I second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Continue that motion for the standing okay. committee appointments. Um, We'll take a separate motion after that for the advisory committee. Okay. I'll <clears throat> do it. Uh, I move that we uh, elect uh, the following uh, committee appointments. Uh, Cape Elizabeth the Education Foundation, Michael Moore, Main School Management Delegate, Joanna Morrissey, and Barbara Powers as the alternate delegate. Uh, PASS, General Advisory Board, Michael Moore, Wellness Committee, Joanna Morrissey, and Heather Altenberg, Technology Steering, John Volz, Transportation Appeals, Barbara Powers and Buildings and Grounds, Joanna Morrissey. Next page. And I'll keep going. Uh, advisory committees. Nope. No mind. We'll do those first. So we need a second. A second. And any discussion? All those in favor? You're on a roll. Okay. I know this is I very exciting. Get a hat trick, Mr. Moore. You've got to be careful what you decide to do motions for. I know. <clears throat> I uh, make a motion to elect the follow uh, following advisory committee uh, members, legislative liaison, Barbara Powers, dropout prevention committee, Michael Moore, community service advisory board, Susanna Mazel hubs with uh, Elizabeth Seifries as uh, an alternate, and the innovation committee, Susanna Mazel hubs and John Volz. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Moving on to adjustments to the agenda. So my recommendation would be that after item 6C, we consider taking item 7G. So that given the weather, we may be able to send um, mm -hmm. those who might wish to leave earlier who are in our audience home <coughs> a little bit earlier. Do we have to do we vote on that? Does the board agree? Great. At this time, I need a motion for item three. I move that we approve the school board minutes um, for the executive session Tuesday, December 8th, 2015, and the regular business meeting Tuesday, December 8th, 2015. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And moving on to comments by student representatives or student representative. Okay, um, so it's our last week of the semester. We have class tomorrow and Thursday, um, and then no school Friday, and then next week are midterms, um, which will close out the second semester. So that's exciting. Um, in terms of sports, um, 
everyone's winter season is in full swing. Um, there's, I don't think, I mean, states are usually over um, February break for sports like skiing um, and track, I think, but we're in the middle of the season for that. Um, our school also just welcomed um, four um, students from India for exchange students for the next couple weeks, um, and they'll have a presentation soon. Um, so that was really exciting. They got here at the beginning of this week. Um, and then also, last thing is that um, our AP government class spent the first three days of last week at the New Hampshire um, primary student convention. So we were there from Monday through Wednesday. Um, and I have a presentation on that. I don't know if we could turn on the projector. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if that was going to be like a big production. We'll take a minute. I will have to run upstairs to get a cable, but maybe if there are no other student representative comments, you could move on to item five and six A mm -hmm. while I do that. And it's okay. I appreciate the offer from <laughs> Principal Tracy to run up and get it, but I would have to try then to describe where exactly that might be found <laughs> beyond my desk, which would be, yes, longer than doing it myself. <laughs> oh, wait. I don't think this is. Are there any comments from the public on agenda items? We could move on to that at this time. Seeing none. It's trying to. move on and we'll right. try and resolve our technical difficulties. So the next item on our agenda is in communications. Greetings to the Tatsé International School of India students. And I think Dr. Alina Perez is going to introduce our visitors and they're going to tell you a little bit about what's planned. Hello. Um, feels like I was just here a little while ago. I'm so happy to be here again. Um, I'll give you a little background. In May and June of 2015, I completed a fellowship at the Toxie School in Sikkim, India. 
um, where I shared my knowledge of classroom management, uh, learning profiles, and cognitive behavioral change. It was a huge growth experience for me and one that I wanted to share with our school here. So I'm really happy to introduce our visitors from TOXI who are here on a five-week exchange pro program in Cape Elizabeth. We have um, four 11th grade students, two of whom are here today. They'll be staying with families and attending classes at a high school and partaking in multiple uh, extracurricular activities while they're here. We also have the Dean of Students, uh, Ms. Malisha Chatri, who's going to be working with our guidance and school um, social work staff across the district. Um, before they just introduce themselves, I wanted to thank our World Affairs Council at the high school, who's directed by Mrs. Oliver and Mrs. Dana at the middle school, who have been really instrumental in facilitating events and helping me to integrate the students into our school district. Um, we have a number of events planned in the coming weeks um, with World Affairs Council, with CIF, um, among others. So I'm just going to let the students and the dean introduce themselves and tell the, you a little bit about their um, background. And then we also have Jonna Friedman, a World Affairs Council um, senior, who will talk a little bit. So um, first, Ms. Malisha. So hello, everyone. My name is Malisha, and I'm the dean of students at Taxi. Um, so first of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank the board to um, having us here. And it's been a pleasure and a lot of learning. Um, so our school is in Sikkim, which is in the northeastern part of India. Um, we are all surrounded by mountains. Um, our school is 10 years old, and we are very small. Uh, we have two, about 230 kids from kindergarten to grade 12. Um, so Taxi is a little unique um, school than various other schools in India because we try to shift from the traditional uh, way of teaching which we all, most of the teachers went through. Um, we try to focus more on activity-based learning and uh, also focus a lot of, um, on reading and writing. Um, so this trip is really important as we'll be learning a lot, experiencing different ways of teaching and classroom management, and also I've been seeing a lot of um, uh, different ways of guidance and counseling to the kids, which is amazing. Um, and I really hope that this trip, will, uh, this trip will have a lot of enrichment both ways, and um, it is wonderful to collaborate and gain this experience. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I have two students out here. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. I am Sharab, and I'm from Sikkim, which is a small state in India, near the Himalayas in India. I am really interested in business studies, and that is one subject I, actually, I really enjoy in class, along with literature. Um, this visit to Maine is pretty important for me and beneficial to me as a foreign student because it allows me to learn the different process of applying to colleges here in America and it gives me um, opportunities to go to colleges and gives me an upper hand on how I'm supposed to actually prepare to apply here. Um, um, from this trip I hope to learn how to live independently and get used to the American culture since it is really different to that of the Indian and the place I come from and I, this exposure I get from this trip will <clears throat> boost my confidence and will make it easier for me to interact with anyone and everyone, I'm guessing. Um, by the end of this trip, I hope to share some knowledge about my culture and tradition to the people I interact with and I hope to make a lot of good friends and leave this place with a lot of, great, with a lot of knowledge. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming. <coughs> I'm really nervous. Um, hi everyone, Kuzangpo. My name is PK. Um, it's actually Pama Karzil Hazen, but it's a really long name and it gets confusing, so everyone just calls me PK. Um, I'm from Bhutan, a tiny country with around like 700,000 people only. It's like sandwiched between India and China. Ever, um, I've been studying at Taxi International School, a really small school in the Himalayas since eighth grade, and now I'm going to be a senior when I go back. Um, Taxi is like in the middle of the mountains, like Ms. Malisha said. It's in this place called Gantok, the capital of Sikkim, and I absolutely love it there. It's like, it's really small, so it's more like a family than a school to me. And the school's motto is Rangsem Rangitawa, which means your mind is yours to observe. 
um, it basically means to be conscious about what you say, when you say it, and like how you say it to somebody. Um, reading is like one of the most popular things at Daxi, like kindergarten to grade 12, and the teachers and our principal and everyone like really loves to read there. Um, basketball and soccer is like one of the most popular games at Daxi. I'm interested in studying history and geography, so these classes are like my favorite parts of the day. I want to go to college in the U.S. because I want to study international relations and work in the U.N. for women and children's rights. Um, attending Cape Elizabeth has been really fun for me, but it's been overwhelming at the same time because I'm meeting like new people every day, and the classes I'm attending are really cool because like some of the concepts I've learned back in school, but most of the things are new, so it's cool. Um, this visit is also really important to me because I feel like it'll help me grow into a more interactive person and give me the exposure I need and it'll also give me like a glimpse of what college might be like in America, I think. So thank you so much for having me here. I hope to leave with, have learned like as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jonna Friedman. I'm a senior um, at Cape Elizabeth High School, and I'm also the president of World Affairs Council. So I've always thought that um, CHS um, has done a really good job um, in um, cultivating students' minds on broadening um, uh, their perspective on the world. Um, in particular, World Affairs Council does a really good job. Um, students in this club uh, can attend discussion panels on a variety of topics and voice their opinions on what should be done to address current international affairs um, and conflicts. Um, World Affairs Council, which is fondly known as WAC, um, also hosts many movie nights and speakers focusing on particular cultures um, or world events happening um, at that time. An offshoot of uh, WAC is Model UN, uh, where students um, can research and understand any country's perspective on a pressing world issue and become an ambassador to um, debate solutions on that topic, which is really cool um, for high school students, I think. Um, sometimes, however, given our location in southern Maine, it can be difficult um, to kind of find that um, uh, international connection and make it tangible to us. Um, but meeting these students from Bataan and Sikkim um, can bridge um, our cultural understanding um, and increase our, aware our awareness on other communities um, around the world. Um, world Affairs Council looks forward to hosting these students at um, uh, our World Affairs Council meetings so that they can share their culture with us and so that we can share our culture with them. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you John. Are there questions or... Hmm. Comments from the board? No, I just would like to thank Alina for bringing these fabulous students, and I just want to compliment you. Your English is amazing. Congratulations on that. I know that's not easy. Thank you. Thanks for fostering this connection. And for being nervous, you did extremely well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very well. And I don't think you have to worry about your confidence. You came across as very confident to us, and I'm sure you would to any college admissions officer. Thank you. So we'll circle back, and Natalie, will you remind us what this presentation is going to be all about? Do you want us to continue and come back to you? Um, sure. Looks like wireless is a little slow. Okay. 
So moving on to ninth grade transition, and I believe we have Principal Shedd and Carpenter here tonight. We also have um, Tom Cohan, who's an Ed Tech 3 at the high school who's working with the program, and Ben Raymond, a high school teacher. <coughs> and students, who I'm sure will be introducing themselves shortly. They will. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. I think we'd love to keep this, uh, continue this whole process to be pretty informal, if you don't mind. Uh, so what we'd like to do is maybe give you a three or four minute sort of conversation of how this all started and what our thought process was putting this together. And then uh, well, all three of us can speak to that and we'll turn it over to the experts who are going through the process at this point and they can give you sort of short synopsis of how they feel thing, things are going and then you can Q&A if that's okay. Is that, is that comfortable? Okay, so we're about a year into the process, if you will. Uh, I think sometime late winter, uh, Mr. Shad and I started thinking about ways to sort of troubleshoot and think of ways we could transition our incoming ninth graders to the high school and make life easier and make things more tall. Well, a good example is a lot of the people I dealt with on a daily basis tended to be freshmen who didn't quite understand what it was like, what the role was like to be a, a high school student. And I spent a lot of my time working with them and saying the same conversations numerous times, unfortunately, at different times. So the, the kind of idea that we put together is let's come together and put a group of kids that really need to learn how to do high school uh, and do high school well. So, don't, Tom, you want to just throw? Well, one of the things um, that we did uh, regarding the, um, or are we going to talk about the, the Fresh Links program? It is a uh, for the, okay so for the for the freshman academy our plan was to sort of a, a, like a three-pronged attack of what we want to accomplish and uh, surviving high school we're talking about study skills organization uh, and then who am I uh, you know sort of getting the students to really take a look at, their, at themselves and then having a voice. Uh, we, do, we do presentations, we do some things, um, we do meditation every day, okay? The piece that, uh, the piece that I, I bring in is that uh, meditation, journaling, uh, to try to get the kids to talk about, you know, being uh, more self-aware of who they are. Sure, and I come in, oh, it must have been Nate's size. I come in and do the um, study skills portion of it, um, or the surviving high school. Um, we focused on a lot of different things throughout the year, and tomorrow we'll do a um, um, presentation on preparing for midterms, a five-day study plan, some things like that. But we've introduced uh, note-taking, two-column notes, um, recording your assignments, checking your power school, what does it mean to check your portal, how do you check your portal, what do these grades mean, um, everything in the beginning in, in the first quarter, trying to give every, these young freshmen a chance to learn from some of the upperclassmen what works, what doesn't work. Um, we do weekly goal setting, um, so they're working on academic goals each week. Um, we are also doing uh, academic goals we've done oh we try to do some team building activities in class um, to engage the kids a little bit more um, get them critical thinking uh, acting together working on as a team and just trying to get them more aware of what they can and can't do we've done um, strengths and weaknesses, where they want to go, where they are now, where they see themselves. I think they'll probably do a better job of explaining it than that, but my portion was study skills. Yeah, so we essentially partitioned, as you can see, we're all passionate about different things. And one of the things I brought was I taught a senior seminar course that it was sort of what I used to do with transitioning seniors out of our district. It was a mandatory course and all seniors had to take it, getting ready for the next step. And so I bring sort of the f trying to figure out who you are as a person to the table, as well as helping them uncover their, their voice, both informally and formally. And um, it, we've had a great deal of success and we've really concentrated on those three principles. A good example would be first quarter. Uh, last year, my first year on the job, saying the same message 15 different times. We had over 40 to 50 different freshman referrals to the office for behavioral issues and those types of things. And this year, we actually had pared it down just to two. 
uh, issues where freshmen were being sent to the office, and they were very minimal, minimal types of things that we had to deal with. The numbers have gone up a little second quarter as freshmen have gotten more comfortable, so I can't, we haven't solved all the world's problems, but at the same time, not every freshman is going through our, our process as well. But anytime one of our guys tends to maybe misstep, it's another chance to follow up on conversations we've already had about what it means to be a great student and who are, are you as a person. So we could tell you many, many different things about the planning, but I think just maybe speaking to the successes of it would be beneficial. So if I could introduce maybe one of these guys could just speak to the actually, that's a good point. There's two different roles here that you're going to see. You'll see we have four. Uh, we decided to carve around 10 to 12 freshmen into our group, our pilot group, if you will with intentions of who, know where, who knows where this could ultimately go to. But we felt rather than just having three teachers in the building that we might be simply seen as teachers initially, we drafted four uh, fresh, uh, juniors into our classroom as well to act as camp counselors, if you will, or coaches, if you will, or cool people, if you will. Um, and they have been an invaluable resource to us in helping these freshmen understand what it takes to be um, a, a great, successful student at Cape Elizabeth High School. So we have two juniors here tonight, and we do have a freshman who's willing to sort of speak to the experience, if you guys don't mind. So, Gavin, do you mind? Could you just speak to what you see as the benefits, per se, of what we're trying to accomplish? Junior to freshman. I think you can talk about their one to probably hear anything right. from your perspective. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Gavin Spidell, and I'm one of the juniors in this class. And um, so just overall, I think this class isn't, as a freshman, I would have loved to take it because it just, it really helps you out throughout, like, everything that you learn in school. It just, like, touches on, you know, everything they said, which would... I would have loved to have been able to have as a freshman, but even as a junior, I'm still learning, I'd say, just as much as these freshmen are. Like, we learn very uh, valuable life skills, and I think that having upper classmen to work with the freshmen is also very uh, valuable, because not only does it form a relationship between underclassmen and upperclassmen, but it also um, just helps them learn through our experiences that we can share with them about high school and do's and don'ts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Eli. I'm a junior as well. And as Mr. Carpenter said, you know, we're sort of coaches, but at the same time, we really participate in the class just as much as the freshmen do. Um, as these guys touched upon, you know, we do a lot of lesson planning and there's a lot of specific things that go into this class, but I think it's really the intangibles that make this class so important, especially to the freshmen. Number one, it gives them familiar faces in the hall, not just through the juniors, but also through having authority figures that they can always turn to. Um, and also I would say that it, it gives kids, including us, but especially for the freshmen, it gives people a community um, where they know that they can speak their mind and have their opinion respected. And that's hugely important um, coming into high school. So thank you. Uh, so this this working? All right. Yeah. So what, what, I, what I feel that I've been getting out of it as well as other freshmen is is definitely it's helped it's helped me transition from middle school to high middle school to high school better than if I had just like been doing it on myself. Um, it's like the main I feel like the thing that's helping this us most in this class towards or or whatever that right is um standing up and giving speeches towards people like what I'm doing right now. I know at the uh, beginning of the year I wouldn't have been able to do this nearly as good as I'm doing it which right now right now and I can't say that it's all get that good right now, but I can say it's better than it was before. You're doing great. You're fine. Um also also you know, just like how how to how how to go about dealing with things, like also sort of it's also preparing us for like going going up to like sophomore and junior and, and uh, senior years, like it's maybe maybe not directly, but I feel that that's my take on it. Sort of indirectly doing that for us. Uh, it feels like what this class the class uh, mostly is is preparation and um, preparation and expanding on the skills that we already have. Uh, yeah. 
There's no disrespect, man, but we really didn't prepare all that much. We just wanted to speak from the heart and let these guys come in and just sort of encapsulate what, what, what's going on. So um, not bad for a couple of guys that found out yesterday they're coming here. Um, <laughs> but awesome. I, I think if you don't mind, we could speak to another program, which is um, Senior Fresh Links, which we overhauled this year, which basically expanded um, the sort of senior to freshman experience for all freshmen this year. Uh, we did questionnaires and surveys with seniors and matched that with certainly with incoming freshmen. So throughout the first month and a half of school, there was a support system in place that was pretty successful, um, and certainly more successful than the past years. And we actually had an event last Friday um, can you, that we try to continue those relationships. Yeah, we, uh, what we did, we put a lot more structure into the Fresh Links. The Fresh Links, um, you know, like Nate was saying, matching upperclassmen, you know, two freshmen. And in past years, you know, it's been, you know, saying hi to them in the hallway, you know, whatever. But uh, this year, with the surveys that we conducted, we really tried to um, do our best to match them with interest. Oh, this, this, this one plays soccer, and, and so does this one, so let's do that. And then we, we tried to Im embed them in the freshman advisories, um, making different, different advisories in the beginning of the year um, mandatory where the, uh, where the upper links would would go to talk about different things, you know, uh, lead discussions about high schools, lead discussions about uh, clubs that they can join. We did that, you know, before the uh, uh, the big the big uh, open open house fair for everyone to you know to sign up for clubs. Uh, last week, in preparation for midterms, uh, we had the upper links go into the freshman advisories, you know, to talk about that, you know, to uh, to talk about their experiences, what they've learned about midterms in their high school, and uh, get questions from the freshmen. And you know, I, I, we, we've heard uh, very positive feedback from, you know, from students, from freshmen, uh, and from you know, from teachers regarding this. So. so we tried to jam two big, big things into very little time, and we're sorry that we maybe exceeded your time limit, but. I think if you don't mind, you would be more than willing to answer any of your questions that you may have regarding either. I don't have a question. I just want to, well, I'm going to say a couple of things. One, um, that the last student who spoke was actually my son. He didn't introduce himself, but I, I'm very proud of him for being up here. And I could never have done this freshman year in high school, ever. So way to go, Aiden. And as a parent, um, I have to say that I've, I've seen so much growth in my son from, from how he handled school in eighth grade versus this year. And it's, it's so much more autonomous and confidently approached. So I want to thank you so much for everything you're doing. And my, my, I guess my one question is, what happened sophomore year? <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's a wonderful question. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I think we're tinkering with all kinds of options. One might be, uh, you know, just by chance and maybe the way I asked the question of the middle school uh, assistant principal about calling out this year's group, we talked about the, the two caveats were what kids could really benefit from some additional academic support next year and who was maybe showing a pattern of, you know, could make better choices once in a while. And so that was what it ended up being, unfortunately, was 11 boys. And so our class, which we did fail to mention, happens to be 11 young men with 11 counselors. It's really given us pause to think about the concept, what if we did the same exact version in a sister version? And we've had pilot conversations, should we do a pilot version that accommodates young women, maybe with the same concepts, but some different um, issues on the table uh, and helping young women transition. But, so that's a great question about next year, four years after. Um, I Aiden, can I ask you something? It kind of goes along with your mom's brag points here. Um, in, a, in a perfect world for next year's ninth grade incoming class, I mean, this was a very small group. Do you think it's appropriate to keep it really small and selective? Do you think it should be something kids could opt into? Would you have friends you wish were having this experience? Um. I, I think I like this. The size of it is, is seeming to work really well because, like, it's it's not too crowded. Where like it's hard, it's hard to focus on one individual, like focus on a lot of individuals. Like, but when with like the amount of people we have, we have, it's it's easy to um, 
you know, keep a profile or something of, of each of them. So, so you, um, you, you can, uh, yeah. And, uh, Individualize it more. Yeah, yeah you, it's easier to individualize and feel like the, the larger class would be hard to do. And with a smaller class, you could do the same, but like, it's, you can do, you, what, who says you can have quality and quantity a bit too. So that, that's my take. But in a, in a perfect world, do you wish that 10 other kids could be in another class and so forth? Or do you think? I think, yeah, yeah, I think that would, be a, that would be a good idea. I feel like it's working for me. I don't see why it wouldn't be working for other people. So that's my take on that. So is that all? Thank you. Joe? Uh, I just did have a question about the gender divide. It's sort of, I'm, I'm curious why. Yeah, that's a great question. Really, no elegant way to ask that. Sorry. Well, my senior seminar courses were all, you know, both genders. It was we tried to create communities where very eclectic groups of people together, men, women, different, you know, abilities academically. But uh, I learned somewhere in the process that, you know, who's acting out. And for, for, unfortunately, maybe for eighth grade boys, they were the ones that were typically visible and in the principal's office. I think if I'd asked the question differently, you know, uh, we would have had a different representation. I can't lie, there were two girls on the initial list, but one of our caveats was if someone already is supported through special education or has a case manager and is watching out for them already, um, we decided to say they were already supported in some way to add a few more boys into the mix. Uh, we had no intentions to do just gender separated. It's just the way it, it worked out. And then the one girl, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. So we, we were feeling our way through this process. It wasn't in our intention at all to, to head that way. But we did see that. Actually, can I ask one of you guys to speak to the gender divide that there weren't women in the room? What are you guys' thoughts on that? Uh, it's, well, this is, this is certainly this is a topic we've covered in the class, too, is you know, why it's, there's only one gender. And um, it's interesting, because this is the first year that this class has been run, obviously, so there's no pre prerequisites. We don't know what it would be like. Um, if you were to put both genders into class, but it's certainly, I think for a lot of people, um, for a lot of kids, especially uh, young boy, like young men, it's, it's easier to open up in a class with the, you know, other, other young men that are going through the same experiences as you. Um, so that wasn't really a, an, an intended effect of having one gender, but it's certainly one that I've seen. So I'd, I would be very interested to see how that dynamic would change if you were to put both genders of, of kids in that pe like period of your life uh, together in a room. Can you speak to that? Can you mind? Yeah. So um, I, I agree with what Eli said. Um, I think that it did work out well just having boys because I think it makes it easier for us to just talk about everything we're going through, but I also think that if there was either a class that had similar like goals that was either like another one that was just girls or one that had both genders I think would definitely work out and should it could be considered. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to know what you think about that. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but <laughs> Yeah, I'd just be curious, then. what do you think? Yeah, I think that would definitely be, be really beneficial. Um, I think that in terms of the gender divide, I guess, you know, it, it, it is definitely possible that, like, freshmen would at least initially go home and just talking to people of their own gender. Just as, I mean, I don't think most of the juniors and seniors probably would have a problem with it, but I think as maybe as freshmen, just because you're coming into a new school and it's all new people, um, it might be easier to talk with people of your own gender. Um, again, I would think that even if you were to have a class with boys and girls, um, for the most part, you would get this, you would get the same results. I don't think it would be a huge roadblock to have a class of mixed genders. So I just wanted to weigh in on um, Joe's question regarding uh, selection and the gender piece of that. And Nate and I have had some conversation about that and having worked with middle school age young women and men um, in my teaching life, um, the kinds of acting out behaviors that we see between the genders do sometimes look a little bit different. And I think an awareness of that 
young women might be struggling, might be not happy and not thriving in school, but it may not mean that they're being sent to the administrator's office. It may not mean that their grades have plummeted, but there may be more covert behaviors that are happening behind the scenes. And you hear a lot about depression and anxiety and um, self-mutilation, cutting kinds of behaviors that, that occur with young women of that age. And so finding mechanisms to unlock and identify who those students are can be a challenge because, because again, those tend to be underground activities. Um, you know, but certainly I think our school counselors are attuned to what, um, what some of those risk factors look like, what kinds of behaviors we want to watch out for. So that's one aspect of that that we've had conversations about. I would also say that as this program was taking shape, you know, Nate's certainly aware, these, these folks are aware there are school-wide programs that have sort of freshman seminars. Portland High School has one. There are some schools build this type of curriculum into their advisory programs. There are a whole variety of models um, to look at. And I think part of you know, the work of this pilot is to examine what might fit best for Cape Elizabeth. And so we're only you know, at January, kind of halfway into the school year. But this is the time that, and not that we haven't been thinking about it all year, but this is the time that, that folks are sort of actively thinking about what's the right next step. And so certainly I think there is an interest in maintaining and expanding this program and how we best scale that and what that might look like is, is still a work in progress. That's great. Um, yeah. I think you're speaking to my question, which was, do you see a future where these sort of um, classes and opportunity to build these executive functioning skills and understanding of high school and, and building sense of self could possibly be offered to all incoming freshmen. I would say yes, that that would be a wonderful uh, next step, but I would, we were talking, Gavin and I, just casually, could you see this at the sophomore, at the junior, as well as the senior? Uh, Catch-22, does it become old hat that you've done similar types of things year after year, or would it could it be dovetailed to the various transitions and be very successful? One of you guys want to take that? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there's things that we could be doing every, with every single grade, um, absolutely, with executive functioning skills, but also with uh, the issues of that year, whatever, you know, freshman year is that transition into high school. Sophomore year it is, wow, this is high school and things are really hard now, what do I do now? Junior year, you're beginning to work on SAT stuff and all those things and then senior year, you're looking at your STP and your transition plan and where am I going to college and all those things. There's definitely things you could do every single year with uh, groups or all students or any matter of uh, or shape of it. Uh, I think what has worked really well with this group of kids is the willingness of the entire group to work together, to um, have conversations together appropriately, respectfully, to agree and disagree respectfully, and the juniors are great role models for the underclassmen in class, out of class. I mean, one of the things that when we were talking, one of the things that the, one of the freshmen had said was, you know, it, it really made me feel good just seeing another friendly face in the hallway. And I really like the way that you say hello to me every time you pass me in the hall, where this junior never would have done that in the past because he just would have never have known his name. Not that he wouldn't do it to other people he know, but he was just put in that situation. And those little things, I think, make a big difference. And we could do it at every grade with, you know, the structure that each grade needs. So I, I really like what you're doing. I think one of the things that has particularly appealed to me is working across grade level and age levels because I think it really fosters a sense of community. When you're younger, you see people that you're looking up to and you understand later on when you're older, you have a responsibility to look out for. And I think, and you also have a vision on, this is what juniors are going through, this is what seniors are going through, and you have a visi visibility, because often you're kind of isolated in your own grade, and you don't really have vision on what's next, what's next, what's next. And our freshmen don't know it yet, but they're going the other direction yeah. this spring. Uh, we'll be taking them to the middle school, and we'll be developing some partnerships with, uh, with the middle school. We're not quite sure what that looks like yet, but it will happen. We just got done. Uh, interview, mid-year mid interviews uh, with the members of Freshman Academy, the freshmen and, and the juniors. And 
I was just so impressed. We had a series of, of, of questions and basically it was a chance for them to talk about Freshman Academy and what they liked or didn't like or, or whatever. And a theme that ran through a lot of them was, you know, this sense of community, like uh, saying that the, the group of students that are sitting around the classroom, I would not have paid attention to at all, you know, had it not been for this, because it is such a mix. And, you know, I, I give you an example about what I've seen with this, and, I, and I'll call it, I'll call it the, we're talking about executive functioning and, you know, surviving high school and all these study skills. I, I'll, I'll speak to the, what they're calling now, the emotional quotient, okay? Like the EQ of things. And what we use for meditation, we use an app, okay, that allows you to uh, identify how you're feeling, okay, how you're feeling. And so I put it up on the smart TV and I'll ask a student, okay, how you feeling today? And so soon after we did this, uh, I was talking to one of the Freshman Academy students about this app. So what do you think? I said, yeah, I, I like it because it gets you to, uh, you know, identify your feeling. And the kid said to me, yeah, uh, like, like right now, I'm feeling kind of frustrated. I was like, well, what's that about? Well, I had this presentation and I, I didn't get as good as great as I thought. And so this led to a 15 minute discussion about, okay, so what do you think about talking to the teacher? Well, what if the teacher gets mad? And so we went into my room and we just processed it out. We, uh, we rehearsed, you know, what he would say. And so, I mean, that's, that's one of these, that's one of these intangibles. That's one of these, you know, uh, maybe just this little example of, you know, something, here's a freshman boy who, you know, I feel now is learning how to deal with that situation. So. Can I say something? Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Great job. Yeah. If you guys don't mind, I'd like Aiden to just come up maybe to speak to the meditation piece, because that was maybe the, the first day you did it versus where we're at now. So uh, the first day that we did the uh, meditation, I was... I was questioning it, like, what, what, why, why are we why doing are we this? I don't, see, I don't see how this is going to help me at all. Um, but, but by around the uh, third or fourth time we were doing it, I started to understand, like, it, like, it, it sort of got me, I, I, I helped, like, relax. It's like I just come back from PE or something, so I, like, I, I said I could, like, calm down. It was easier for me to focus when I was ask, asked questions in class, and I, I feel like it's a... It's a good way of just of like clearing your mind from what happened before then, so you can just focus on what you're doing right now or then. Nice. I'll just add to that that I, I know when I visited your class that one of the comments, and that was at late September, so you'd had a little bit of experience with that mindfulness practice, but one of the things I heard one of the juniors in your class say was, it's the only quiet five minutes that I have in my day, and it makes such a big difference. <laughs> um, I, I would say one benefit for me of the meditation that I wasn't expecting is it's certainly a, a period of time where you just relax in your day, but it's also a great time for just a mental check-in, um, and it's, it's like every day you get to practice that, so, you know, some days you won't really realize it, but when you have those five minutes where you're just sitting there, you, you, you know, you realize you're maybe feeling frustrated or you're upset about something you didn't even know. And that something was just, you know, making your day worse. And, and so it's been, it's been really cool. Um, the mindfulness is a huge piece of it as well, being able to focus in the moment on activities. But it's also just that ability to mentally check in with yourself and be like, you know, like, so what is, you know, what's going on right now? Like, where are the kinks in the system? So that's, that's been a really huge uh, advantage of that practice. I would say we chose the right three people, but anybody we brought in here would have been equally as good. Just so you know. No, that's not including. <laughs> Barbara, I just, I just have to reflect back for two minutes and say, 35 years ago, I co-taught Freshman Academy with the principal of the high school. I was in Earball. And all the kids took it, and we jammed them in the lecture hall. 
And we went through executive function. It was a one credit course for a semester. We went through executive functioning. We went through things to expect in high school. We went through personal finance. No one would have stood up here and talked about what it meant to them like you are. So the tension around the capacity of offering it for all versus finding those who could really benefit and making it highly personal really is striking me as so valuable. So I think, I think the pilot is proving itself to be you know, really extraordinary, Mr. Shedd and Mr. Parker. So thank you. Thank you for sharing all this with us tonight. Thank you so much. And at this time, please do not make any plans for a snow day. <laughs> Thank you, Gavin and Eli and Aiden. Look at the window. It has been. Are we circling back? It's not supposed to be. Natalie, are you connected? All right. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, like I said earlier, um, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I had to look for a second. I, know, <laughs> I, like, Wait a I don't think um, you can all be there. <laughs> Um, our AP, AP government classes went to the New Hampshire Primary Student Convention, so we missed the first two days of school back from break, um, which was a little bit upsetting for some of the teachers as midterms are next week, but, you know, it was fun. Um, so we had about 50 kids and um, four teachers come with us. Um, so I'll just, we have the pictures organized, um, like in chronological order, so I can just walk you through part of our trip. So um, the person who got us I guess, um, into this conference was a CAPE graduate, Morgan Smith, who now works at New England College. Um, I know she also is in, t I'm currently in touch with her, I'm trying to um, get hold of a video from one of the seminars that we went to. Um, so she's been, I've been communicating with her because she's in touch with the, um, the man who took all the videos at the conference. So um, I've been in touch with her and she was really helpful in getting us the spot in the conference. Um, so that was really great. For us. Um, so our first presidential candidate was Bernie Sanders. Um, so we got to see five presidential candidates in person who all came and addressed the crowd. There were probably about 500 students there, um, and there were students from, mostly college students, um, but they're from New Hampshire. I think we were the only ones from Maine, but there were students from as far away as Oregon and Louisiana, um, which was pretty cool. Um, so Bernie Sanders was the first one um, to address the crowd um, and we had so we had five of those two days three days actually um, and so they normally gave about a half an hour long speech and then gave a half an hour for question and answer um, so that was a really great great way to learn more about their policies um, Mackie Wood took a selfie with every candidate <laughs> that came <laughs> um, she made it her personal mission to get a selfie with everyone so there's her selfie with Bernie Sanders um, more pictures of Bernie. Yeah, he was he's was pretty popular there, I think, because there's a huge liberal presence among all the students. Um, so I think far and away he was the most popular candidate. Um, College students. Why not? Yeah. Um, and we all thought that was pretty cool because in terms of candidates that are getting a lot of news lately and that seem to be in the front um, in the front of the pack, he was the only one that came. Um, I know Jeb Bush was supposed to come and decided not to at the last minute, I think. Um, but we all thought that was, I mean, Hillary Clinton sent a surrogate. Um, ben Carson came in through Skype. Um, but in terms of candidates who were really at the front of the pack, Bernie was the only one that came. Um, so I think a lot of people really appreciated that he was able to come um, and talk to us. So Phoebe Coburn um, found her STP. She's going to be working with Chris Christie's campaign. Um, she called Chris Christie her political idol. And he came um, on Tuesday, and she was just thrilled that he was there. And I'm not entirely sure how she wound up working on his campaign for her STP, but she did. Um, so she was thrilled about that. So that was, that was a really great opportunity for her. And here's Chloe Gillian with Chris Christie. More selfies with the candidates. Um, so Chris Christie was the second one to come. Um, and I think a, a lot of people said after his presentation that they liked him a lot more um, after watching him right in front than versus like on the debates. 
Um, I think a really good thing that we are, were all able to pick up from this conference was seeing the candidates without any filter from the media. Um, I know that sometimes they can seem like they give off a certain angle, um, but I know that like Chris Christie has that reputation of being very belligerent and kind of brash, and he wasn't like that at all um, when we saw him in New Hampshire, so that was really interesting. Um, some of the under can other candidates kind of left the same impression that we were all surprised, like this was what wasn't how we would normally think of this candidate, but I guess seeing, what, seeing them in person, um, they could definitely have a different effect. So that was really nice to be able to see. Um, I don't know if this is going to work, but yeah, okay. I don't think it's going to go, um, but I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. Um, so Hadley, um, Britt asked probably four to five questions um, to the candidates, and that was really cool because there were 500 students there, and you know, probably only five to six of them got to ask any of the candidates questions when they visited. Um, and Hadley got to ask a bunch, so that was really great for her. She was, I mean, I think most people from our high school just never even raised their hand, and she must have raised her hand 12 times. Um, so that was really great for her. She asked one question of Carly Fiorina um, that actually, actually ended up getting an article, a short article in the Boston Globe about her question for um, Carly Fiorina. It was about feminism um, mm -hmm. and funding for Planned Parenthood. Um, so I don't think the video is going to go, but yeah, she, she got to ask a lot of questions. Matthew Fishbein also asked a couple, um, so that was really good for them. Here's us um, accosting Chris Christie. <laughs> you have to you have to get to them quickly because a large crowd would form, and you know you have to be really aggressive if you want to get a picture with them. So yeah, more students with Chris Christie. There they are again. <laughs> Um, yep, and his wife, and Phoebe with her political idol. So um, next candidate we saw was Rand Paul, and there's Mackie again. Uh, so he came also on Tuesday and spoke to us. He didn't actually give a speech, he just took time for a question and answer session, um, and we got mentioned on his Twitter, so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> And we also saw John Kasich, um, and he was really great. I think he was another favorite um, because he's he's a very, very good public speaker. Um, he gave a really inspiring speech. Um, again, this was just a really great experience to be able to see all of these candidates. They were so close. I mean, we had to get there early if you wanted to get a table in the front row. Um, but if, if you could get a table in the front row, you were literally five, 10 feet from these candidates who were running for the presidency, which was really incredible. Um, and I think we all took like 500 pictures because we just like, couldn't believe that they were actually right there. Um, so again, there's another video of, of Matthew Fishbein <laughs> asking John Kasich a question. And there's Mackie again. We also saw Carly Fiorina. Um, and she was another, another favorite of the convention. I think she did a really good job. She's a, another very, very good public speaker. Um, so yeah, she was she was great to see. Um, again, I think she was probably maybe the, I think the second most popular of the candidates that we saw behind Bernie Sanders. Um, she had a huge following, and it's, it was really nice um, because you can you can tell that the atmosphere was very charged um, at this entire conference throughout both the seminars and the presidential speeches. But you know, especially. It, this comes to mind especially with Carly Fiorina's speech where she'd be talking and people would just start applauding or, you know, shouting like, you got our vote um, out from the audience. Which, and that went on for the entire three days, which is really cool to see because, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to get a whole group of high schoolers like really rallied behind a political cause. Um, but this was really fun to see because we have mostly college students who um, are more well-versed in politics than we are. Um, so it was a really good way to kind of immerse ourselves in that whole environment. Um, also because it was, you know, we're getting close to the New Hampshire primary um, and we're right in Manchester, so it was definitely a really cool environment to be in. Uh, Jillian Peterson is infatuated with Carly Fiorina, so um, she had to get pictures with her. And yep, there she is again. 
Yeah, again. They, a lot of the candidates were giving out um, t-shirts and signs and bumper stickers and water bottles, so we all had to take advantage of the free merchandise. <laughs> and there she is with more people. And, yeah, more people. Yep, and that concludes Matthew's selfies with every mm -hmm. candidate. Um, and so in the, in the lobby of the hotel, each presidential candidate had a booth, um, and even the ones that weren't there, so like Donald Trump, um, Ben Carson, Hillary Clinton, everybody had a booth. Um, and there were also a lot of booths from interest groups, um, and so you could walk through and educate yourself on any of the campaigns, which was really fun. And there's Rand Paul again. Marco Rubio was not there, but he had a cutout standing in a corner, so that's, that's good enough. Um, emotional video. So, um, when we weren't with the presidential candidates, there were a series of um, seminars going on in the different salons throughout the hotel. One of these, I didn't go to this particular session, um, but it was on um, political science, kind of an introduction to political science, um, and they had professors from New Hampshire colleges there. This whole thing was run by New England College, um, so there were a lot of faculty and alumni of that, of that school there. Um, I think the, the seminars were a really great way to learn kind of the ins and outs of different um, specific aspects of politics. Um, I went to one on, that was run by the Women's Defense League of New Hampshire and was basically like a Second Amendment versus gun control uh, debate. I went to one on um, immigration and how that's going to affect the 2016 elections. Um, I went to one on bird dogging, um, and I went to one on um, contributions from interest groups and how that affects um, the elections. So we also had Ben Carson via Skype. Uh, we also had Martin O'Malley via Skype. So they didn't come, but that was almost, I mean, that was, I think, just as good as being able to, to see them on stage because he could still respond to our questions and, and talk to us. So, I mean, it wasn't really a, a huge deal to not have them there in person. And then, finally, we had um, Vermin Supreme come talk to us on the last day there. So he's a performance artist who wears a boot on his head and normally carries around a giant toothbrush. Um, so he came to talk to us on the last day, which was pretty funny. Um, his entire political plot, he's not really running for president, but his political um, platform is that if he were elected, every person in America would get a free pony. Um, so this is his ponynomics, his supposed system of government. So I think that was a lot of people's um, favorite part of the convention because he was pretty funny, but he was up there for an hour. Um, which, so he was given the same amount of time as any candidate. Um, which was really funny, but at the same time, he was there for an hour, and like after about 20 minutes, a lot of people were like, okay, we're, we're like, this is getting old. Uh, but it was certainly entertaining. So, yep, so he was, he was the last one that we saw. Um, and then that concluded our trip. Um, so overall, it was a really, really great experience. We had a lot of freedom. Um, we were just staying, um, right in downtown Manchester, and I mean, there were 50 students and four chaperones, so we had a, a good deal of freedom. Um, we basically were allowed to go to any seminars that we wanted to, um, whichever one sounded interesting. We were basically on our own for food, um, which had to tell the chaperones if we were leaving the building, and there were probably 10 restaurants within walking distance. Um, so we all roomed together, and we could just walk around and go get lunch, go get dinner, and then we'd all, I think pretty much everyone went to all of the presidential candidate speak, uh, speeches just because we were like, you know, Bernie Sanders is in there, you have to go. Um, so we would all conjoin at those and then split up and some people would go to whatever seminars they found helpful, some people would go back to the hotel room if they said, oh, there's nothing going on that sounds interesting right now. Um, but overall, it was definitely a really, really great learning experience. I think the one thing that we picked up that was most helpful was getting to see the candidates without that, um, whatever spin the media might be putting on them. Um, I know a lot of people, like, like I said before, um, a lot of people's impressions of Chris Christie changed a lot. Same with Rand Paul. Um, people would watch them speak and say, that is not how I pictured them at all. And you know, it, you really got a sense for their, their persona, um, just being able to talk to them, being able to take pictures with them. 
Um, so that was really cool. And again, like I said earlier, it was really, really helpful to be in, in that environment full of people who are passionate about politics and who knew what they were talking about. Um, college students and college professors who were really well learned on these topics. Um, and they were from, like I said, all over the country. Um, so that was, a, that was definitely a really special experience. Um, I know some people at the beginning of this year were disappointed that we weren't going to get to go to Washington, D.C., but I think this was a you know, more than sufficient substitute. And yeah, that's it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Does anyone have questions? What's, the, what's STP is what? Um, it's a senior transition project. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the two to three weeks that we spend yeah. after we're done with midterms, um, not midterms, AP exams. Well, your uh, enthusiasm for this really shows, and we yeah. appreciate you sharing it with us. It sounds like it was a great and fun experience. It was, yeah. Thanks. So. We're going to skip ahead for a moment. Oh, no, we're not. I was kidding. Um, we're going to move on to administrators' strategic plan updates. With cutouts of political figures? I don't know. Good evening. I just love it. Um, first, I want to say welcome to um, board member, new board member, um, Alton Berg, and um, returning board chair, um, Cyphries, and board member Volz. Um, it's nice to have you. Um, and all of you back again, obviously. Um, Meredith has asked um, each of us to update all of you on the new evaluation pilot that we're doing right now. Um, but before that, I just wanted to say a few words about our new assistant principal, um, Teresa Curran. Um, she started on Monday, January 4th, and she really has hit the ground running. She's really just done a phenomenal job. But there's something I really wanted to share with you that um, we, were, we were surprised, I guess, on the first day um, when she came, because my, when I gave the announcements, I wanted to let students know it was her first day, and I put it in the newsletter, but the students aren't always going to be seeing the newsletter necessarily. And um, so I was thinking in my head quickly. I said, well, she's tall. I said, I said she's, I was describing her. I said, she's tall, and she has on a bright blue jacket, kind of like the color of Mary's wearing now. And I said, she's probably going to be with me for a lot of the, um, throughout the week. Um, so you can be watching for her, and she'll be visiting classes. And that's all I said. I didn't prompt, I didn't say anything else. And, um, you know, other than, you know, she's excited to be here. And so um, one of her first experiences was joining me in the lunchroom. As you know, it's a fine dining experience in the Pond Cove Cafetorium. And she, came, at the end, we were in for both lunches, and she, um, she told me that how many students had approached her, because um, they recognized the blue jacket. They kept saying, that she's, this, you're, she's wearing the blue jacket. She's wearing the blue ja jacket. And so she told me what they said, and I said, you should send that out to the staff. So this is what students, students totally unsolicited and unprompted, had said to her. Congratulations. You will love it here. It is the best school ever. I'm so glad you are here. I love this place. It's so nice to meet you. I think you will like it here. We have the best teachers. You will really like it. Pond Cove is the best school. You'll love it. And I thought, here we have these ambassadors in our cafetorium today greet on her first day. So she sent a lovely email to the staff, and she, she credited the staff for you know, creating a climate that you know, um, that welcomed her like that. And it was just really, you know, really powerful. It was just really nice um, way for her to start, you know, her, her tenure. So we were really excited to ha have her there. So I'll be really brief about um, the teacher evaluation pilot is actually going really well. Um, and it's based on, as you know, the Kim Marshall model. And it is Essentially, we have, um, in Pong Cove, we have seven teachers who have um, volunteered to pilot. And so we have uh, one first grade teacher, two second grade teachers, a thir third grade teacher, a fourth grade teacher, our music teacher, and a special education teacher. And um, the model is, and we also have 10 probationary staff who we're evaluating on, on the current one, that's the current model that's in the contract. And um, for the um, Marshall Plan, I keep calling it, <laughs> but the um, Marshall Model is essentially we go in for 10 to 15 minutes and 
just really get a snapshot. They're all unannounced. And um, we go in, get a snapshot. Obviously, I have all their schedules, so I know, you know when, what's, what's happening when. Um, and then uh, we meet as soon as we can, um, right after it's just a debrief. And then they, within 48 hours, they get a brief written feedback um, on really just the, the focus. And Meredith can tell you, I'm working on my brevity. I'm getting it down to three quarters of a page. It's supposed to be a paragraph. Um, and we, the three of us compared. Um, mine was the longest. And they said, well, Kelly, what does your short one look like? And I said, this is my short one. <laughs> so I'm getting down there. But, um, but it's going really well. And teachers are really feeling um, they're eager. I mean, finding the time, that's, it's, it's a bit of a crunch because it's either their planning time or their lunch time that, um, or before or after school, and often, you know, one or both of us have meetings, but you know we're making it work, and I think they're anxious to hear the feedback. Um, but I think that the frequency of it, it's it's really creating um, a strong professional relationship, and also really I think helping establish, um, you know, what their practices really are, and based on their smart goals they've created, um, they've created smart goals. Um, two of them, one is around um, their own professional growth, and the other, the other is around student learning growth. And so, smart goals—it's um, an acronym first. They have to be strategic, measurable, attainable. Uh, um, um, R. Uh, relevant. And time. time bound. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and so they and they can tweak them at any time. Some of them are coming in saying, "I think I, I think I didn't narrow. I think mine's too broad, or I think mine's too, too narrow." I mean, so it's, it's flexible. And because it's a pilot, um, we're asking them for their feedback. How is it going? And so we've done some initial, we've done one initial survey. And so, so right now we're in the mid cycle. So we're doing mid cycle conferencing of you know revisiting their smart goals and how it's going. So. Um, so that's that's it in a nutshell. So, cool. questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Guess it's all yours, Mike. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, as in on the evaluation system, I can say personally, I'm very excited and optimistic about um, the new pilot model that's been developed and is continually being refined, as, as Kelly mentioned, as we go forward. But um, I'm really struck by the potential to really impact educational practice and to maximize learning. Um, and I really want to commend the teachers who have stepped up and have opted to participate, because I, I think it's a very brave thing to do. I, I think it, it, I really appreciated the teachers who have put their faith uh, in me and in the administration to kind of step forward and try something we haven't done, to be willing to partner, to learn together, um, to be willing to collaborate in a, in a goal setting process, um, be willing to um, accept feedback, um, but also be willing to give feedback um, in part of learning to be um, a, a better instructional coach and, and to get better at providing instructive feedback as I've given teachers instructive feedback, I've asked them to give me instructive feedback. How did that conversation go? Is there anything um, that I could have asked you that might have helped you reflect better on your practice? Um, I started by asking you this question, does that work? And so it's been a very open, transparent process about learning together, and I've really appreciated that. Um, the core of this process and the power of it really comes through conversation, and teachers are really seeing and talking about the impact of, of the frequency of this model. It is not a pre-planned um, full class period long observation. Um, it's frequent, it's brief, frequent, and ongoing mini observations and teachers are really noticing. It was really great that you got to see the beginning of this lesson and then you came and you saw the middle of another lesson and you saw the end of another one and you're, you're seeing how it all fits together. And um, we're having conversations about practice that have already surpassed conversations I had maybe over a whole two years of, of working with different teachers. So I think that really speaks to the benefits of, of this model versus that one shot deal of kind of a, my grandest best lesson when I know you're coming. And this is a much more um, genuine, realistic reflection of what teachers are doing. Um, you know, I, I think um, 
the, the last thing I would say is that um, it, it, everyone knows that it, it is a pilot that we have an opportunity to give our input to make it better. Um, I've just seen a lot of comfort and a lot of open participation and collaboration that I think speaks very well to the success of the of the pilot becoming our model moving forward and so um, I think it's going extremely well and again I commend the teachers who have uh, openly participated in the in this process it's been it's been great just a quick question Mike and it would be same for Kelly and Jeff what's your goal when you talk about frequency how many of these 10 to 15 minute minis are you trying to do right. for each teacher? Right now we're aiming for six um, visits um, over, you know, over the course of a year um, with an average of a 15 minute window. We can stay longer, um, we have that option. If uh, you're in a class and you see some, this is very interesting and I really want to stay, that's understood that that's part of the process. And I, teachers have really loved it when you say, or you know, you're getting ready to go um, and say, oh, I, hope, I want you to stay and say, what's next? Great, sit back down or walk around. And, and part of walking around is you have conversations with students about, tell me what you're learning and, and why, and what's, what's the purpose of that? And um, why do you think you're being asked to do that? And so it's, it's kind of a very fluid, Process. The purposes of the pilot, the rubric itself is pretty dense, mm -hmm. and six visits probably wouldn't allow you to really score that whole rubric. So, what, how are you approaching all of you? Again, I don't know. Really sure. Oh, I don't. How know. are you approaching as part of the pilot being actually able to complete this massive right. rubric? I think it's more a matter of prioritizing and focus, and part of that would come through the goal setting process. Okay. So, through I could see what which goals. Um, teachers are really wanting to focus on and get feedback on. Part of the rubric is a self-assessment and we've decided together that it is uh, a lot and we know we can't do it all, particularly within a pilot. So what, what particular areas of the rubric do you want to focus on Good. and make sure I give you feedback on? Yeah. So that's That'll be a really important learning for the pilot about how to really get your arms around all, all the components of that thing. So good for you. That's yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to steal a, a small part of my small part of my small amount of time to just give you a brief introduction to NIASC. I have to do that because it actually does, and, I, and then I'll make a couple of comments about teacher evaluation. So while maybe Jeff's handing those out, I'll make a couple comments about evaluation as well. Um, Ruth Ellen's not here this evening, but this work is also going on for administrators. And I think one of the benefits as we work through this pilot is administrators are experiencing the rubric piece, as you alluded to, Barbara, from, uh, from their own work and the goal setting process from their own work at the same time that they're working with teachers on those aspects. Um, the evaluation steering committee met last week and, and we're certainly hearing from people a lot of anxiety about the timeline and the multiple components. So we're trying to remind people that this pilot is a very compressed time period, that for our continuing contract people this process is happening over a three year period. They're going to have a minimum of 15 of those observations over a three year period. There are going to be 15 minutes, like a minimum of 15 conversations, a goal setting process, a check in a year and a half in, or sooner if either party wants to do that. Then they're going to be meeting at the end of the process to say, geez, how did I do meeting those goals? And time to sort of reflect and, and focus and change those along the way if there's a need for that. So, you know, I, I think one of the things the committee has taken away so far from the feedback is. We need to help people to yeah, take a take breath. A breath. <laughs> that there's time for this, yeah. that this isn't a race. This is really about instructional practice, and we want, we want people to honor the process and the conversation and the work that's related to that. And um, I, I, I would agree with the, you know, Mike and Kelly's assessment that I think people are very receptive to it and appreciative of it. For administrators, this is about honing. Yeah. You know, as Kelly said, we're practicing together both the observation process. I've walked through buildings with our administrators and visiting classrooms with them to sort of mm. talk about, okay, you know, what are those couple of 
things that you want to talk to the teacher about afterwards so that we can narrow that focus. We're talking about, we're reviewing those written feedback pieces together so that we can tailor them down to sort of what are those key points because we don't have unlimited time for those conversations. And practicing the routine of, geez, I've got to make sure I'm doing two or three of these every day in order to get in, you know, the right amount over the course of the year. So I think that's the other worry that teachers have. How do I know that my administrator is going to fit all of this in? There are so many other things competing for their time. How, how do I know that they're going to stay true to this? And so this process is, is yeah. us demonstrating our commitment to this work as well. And I, I think we share the belief that this classroom work, this work with teachers, is the most important work right. we do. It's what has the greatest impact on instructional practice and outcomes for kids. So it's the priority area for us, and it's where we're starting um, and focusing our time. That's great. So, Niask, um, I've given you a folder. Um, I've put on the, the label, includes the dates of Niask, uh, March 13th to 16th. Um, I would ask you as board members, if you can, if you're going to be around on Sunday, March 13th, um, that is a day when the members of the NEASC visiting team would appreciate having an opportunity to meet with you. Um, I can't tell you exactly when that will be until we get to meet with the uh, person who's appointed the chair of our visiting team, and we haven't been told that yet. So let me back up, though, first, before I get into the details of the visit, but I wanted to plant the seed March 13th, Sunday, March 13th. That's an important day. Um, we are accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, as are virtually all high schools in New England. Uh, there are regional accreditation commissions for every single region of the country. Uh, NIESC happens to, to accredit both public secondary schools, private schools, and also colleges, as is implied in its name. I'm not going to talk about these standards for accreditation, but they are the touchstone for everything that um, the, that we have been working on for the last year and a half um, as a school, sort of taking a look at these standards under a whole bunch of different areas and deciding how we measure up and where we're strong and where we need to do better. So that is what the NEASC visit is designed to accomplish, is to give us a report, is to have us examine our own practices and come to some conclusions about where we measure up and where we don't. Um, and one of the key documents, in fact, probably the entire key document, is this vision and mission statement that the board approved uh, back on June 10th, 19, 2014, um, the new revised, uh, and, and that is the other document. Because so basically what the standards say is you've got to have a mission statement that says what you're all about, what you stand for academically, civically, socially, and then your, the practices of your school should reflect um, the priorities that you've set forth in the mission statement. So I've, then I've given you two things, which are, so there will be 15 people coming to visit us from March 13th, uh, Sunday, March 13th, to Wednesday, March 16th. It is an intense time of folks coming in, taking a look at our self-study materials, and then making determinations about where, whether hopefully verifying our conclusions about where we think we're strong and where we think we, can, we need to get better. Um, there's an, and they will meet with school board members, I hopefully. Um, they'll meet with Mike and Kelly, um, other administrators, the superintendent, students, parents, uh, lots of teachers. Um, they'll be shadowing students. They'll be looking at student work, talking about it with teachers. And this one page that I've given you is a sample schedule for how the process works. The second one is more detailed. It's a sample visiting uh, schedule. And I wanted to give this one to you in particular because the Sunday schedule is important. Um, and again, this, the actual schedule that we may eventually have to work out so that I will give to you when it's final may be slightly different from this, but it'll be sort of in this ballpark. Um, so we'll have a panel presentation. I'm going to twist Natalie Vaughn's arm and try to get her as part of that panel um, for a number of different reasons. Um, she, doesn't, she just heard that right now. Then there, are, there will be concurrent meetings with school board members and parents, and then there's teacher interviews, and then the committee goes back and does, begins to do a whole lot of work. I will say, having, visit, as, having been a part of a number of visiting teams, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's all volunteers with 
it's all volunteers. It's educators from around New England. They likely will most, mostly come from Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Um, and they all are coming from their own schools, their own cultures, and they're taking a look at Cape Elizabeth High School. And it is an intense and grueling process, and it can be extraordinarily helpful. The board will get, um, in the not too distant future, I'm thinking within a couple of weeks, the entire self-study report. Um, it's being finalized. Um, that self-study report is what we've been working on for the last year and a half. We've had parent input, student input, um, a lot of teacher work, and you'll, you'll be getting that, and you'll see where we think, where we're saying against the standards, we're strong and where we need to get better. Uh, because we are strong, but we do need to get better. So, and you will also see, I think, that there's a fair amount of alignment between what we've concluded about ourselves and what the strategic plan says, which is certainly one of the documents that we that we took into account. Um, so about teacher evaluation, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, this process is so much more helpful, uh, I think helpful for teachers, I think, um, and definitely helpful to me as a principal to, to know what's, have a real read of what's going on. Um, our minimum is six visits. We all hope we can get upwards a, a little bit more than that, but our, our minimum is, is we want to get to six visits. I will say that one of the things that it has been helpful for me to see is to see a teacher in one class teaching something and then going in and seeing another teacher teaching the same class and then being able to connect those teachers, uh, which is really kind of cool. Begin to see some common themes. Um, the other day I was, I was this, this was my big aha from one moment. It sounds like a very little thing, but I think it's a huge thing. A teacher, a student asked, could she go to the bathroom? The teacher said, yep, you can go to the bathroom, but be back right away. Um, she was back within about two minutes, and the teacher, when the kid came in, the teacher smiled and gave the kid a fist bump. It was really cool um, because it sort of says, I recognize you, I, you did what I asked you to do, and the, girls, the, girls, the, the student who was a girl smiled, and it was a nice, important moment. Um, I, so I've seen fist bumps. I've, seen, I've had conversations with two teachers recently, just within the last week, who are AP teachers, wonderful, inquisitive, curious kids. And in both classes, the kids were just not, not participating the way they should have been participating. I don't think Natalie Vaughn was in one of those classes. Um, and I had conversations with both the teachers afterwards, and the, and the conversation was the same. Why are these kids not willing to take risks? They'd done all the work. They had great ideas, and they were participating. Uh, but there was just, you could sense that they were holding back. Um, and. It's a, it's a cultural thing. It's, it's, it's an issue. So I've begun to talk with those teachers and gave them some articles, some things to try. I don't know if they're going to be trying them. About talking about risk taking and talking about why sometimes it's hard in a community like this where everybody wants to be perfect to take risks and to be able to be willing to make mistakes. Um, I've seen teachers having, using really great formative assessment tools, sort of quick check-in tools, and I can say, suggest to another teacher they can go up and talk to this other teacher about things. Um, and the other day I saw a class um, and it was very clear to me that the instruction was way over the kids' heads. It, they were getting into a level of detail that there's no way that... Um, um, and so we, so we had a follow-up conversation with the teacher and, and talked about some other possible ways to approach things and the teacher was very open to that and so the teacher took some, some materials that I had found um, in their area and suggested to take a look at and they said okay I'm going to go copy this with my colleague and we're going to take a look at it so we're going to have a follow-up conversation in a few days. Um, I will say seven, a, a number of the teachers that I'm working with, I think seven of the teachers are actually um, starting the process of doing student surveys um, using this, this uh, there's an organization that's based in Cambridge called Panorama Surveys. They're young but growing very quickly and some of the teachers have already started to do some surveying of kids. So I'll be fascinated to see how, how that takes off. The assurance that I gave to teachers in return if they were willing to do it is they don't have to share the results with me. It's for their self-reflection. And that's it. They were, they were willing great. to do it. So it's good. It's great. So, any? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you,
don't get too comfortable, Jeff, because we're skipping ahead to item 7G, which is program of studies. So you may you may be called on just, you know. So if we could skip ahead to 7G, may I have a motion, please? I make a motion that we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School Program of Studies for 2016-2017. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Jeff, are there any new things that you'd like to highlight or touch upon for the board's benefit? Uh, we, I think, tried to do a better job, and it will actually, when it gets finally published, um, that the beginning section, which is really about the alternative pathways things that have been a topic of board conversation, we've tried to put that out front a lot better to put in some more graphics. There's a couple more that are going to be coming in. Um, um, and I will say that all the students, while well, the ninth, 10th, and 11th grade students got a week or two ago, um, a detailed sort of um, explanation about the student-driven learning program and application materials for those who are interested in doing it. So applications are already coming in for that program, which we hope to expand in numbers next year. Uh, I think it's been really successful. There are, there's a couple of new courses um, under one of the math Courses under CPFS under math. There's a course called College Prep Functions, Statistics, and Trigonometry. And right at the bottom, there's a caveat that says this may be replaced by a dual enrollment course offered with SMCC. I think I mentioned that at a recent board meeting. We're still in conversations, uh, waiting for SMC to get back to us about with a few more details. But I'm, I think we're really excited about that as a possibility. Um, there's a revised kind of cool variation of the economics program um, that is being proposed, um, which is, it's not called this, but it's sort of a takeoff on sort of the Freakonomics set of books, and if you're familiar with those, sort of applying economics concepts to human behavior and that sort of thing. It's kind of cool. Um, I'm doing this off the top of my head because I forgot, I forgot to bring it, but I think those are, those are the major things. Is the um, Freshman Academy considered a course, Jeff? Yes, it is considered a course. Okay. Is it, is it in? Is it in? Uh, if it isn't, it should be. Yeah, because that would be a great thing to... I was looking. Anybody? Let's see. Honors? Let's see. Um, this is the beginning part. Has I will, I will double that check it. That doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, exactly. It's not, I will make sure it gets in. There's no reason why it's not in except my omission. Yeah, I'd, I'd want it to this, be really it, recognized. No question about it. So outstanding. Great. Yep. It will be in. Great. And is it a, is it a, a one, two, how many hour course are you considering it? Freshman Academy? Yeah. It's a four year course. Is it a four year course? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. It's a four-year course? Full year. Full year oh. course. Full year. Sort of would defeat the course, course of calling it. Yes. It, it is a, it is a <laughs> 10 credit full, 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 full year course. course. But it is being treated as a pass-fail course. Yes. Yeah. As a what? Pass-fail course. Oh, pass yep. Great. Thank you for catching that. I, yes. Any questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <coughs> we need a vote. So, yeah, I think we're going to circle back around to item six. Do we want to take a vote? On oh, we need to. Oh, so we have a motion. First. I apologize. We do. We do. I we did. There was a motion. motion so. I seconded. Yeah. <laughs> All in favor. Moving on. I apologize. I'm new at this. <laughs> Circling back to 6E. Highlight that if any of our administrators want to leave due to the weather concerns. I can't tell from here what it's doing outside right now, but certainly you all should feel free to do that. You're welcome to <laughs> drive safely. <laughs> 
So I think we are on item 6E, and we have two calendars, of draft one and two, a potential budget meeting for the upcoming budget season. This is draft two, apparently, coming to you first. Oh, thank you. Are these changes to the ones that are in five? I don't believe they are changes, but we were asked to just make sure you had hard copies available, and these may be in, some of you may not have had color copies, so. Um, so the distinctions between the drafts, there has been conversation in the past about making budget workshops more accessible to the public. Um, typically our budget workshops are held in the high school library. We have someone, um, from our technology department typically come to videotape those. Those videos are ultimately uploaded to the website. The opportunity to utilize the chambers was um, something we looked into and it is available on Wednesday evenings, not on Tuesday evenings. So I, I know the town has indicated that it would be willing to um, take care of staffing or <laughs> do its best to find staffing, but would, would cover the cost of staffing um, for the TV studio if the board chose to have those meetings on Wednesday nights rather than Tuesdays. Um, I was asked to just inquire with the administrative team whether Tuesdays or Wednesdays made a significant difference to their schedule. We're comfortable with either, so we would just ask for a decision to be made soon so that we can plan accordingly. Well, I'll throw out that um, Elizabeth nicely updated us about some of this thinking, and I immediately said that Wednesdays are a pretty tough night for me. I will say that right out. I could maybe get to one of them, but it's a really tough. I protect Tuesdays with my life, <laughs> but other nights can get a little hairy. I, I love the idea of it. I think the taping um, also is, is super appropriate, too. Is there, uh, I'm sorry, is there an uh, option for taping on Tuesdays at the library? Yeah, we still would be able to do the taping in the library. Okay. I think it was the it wouldn't be of us. having those meetings it wouldn't be available be live. live. It wouldn't be a live taping, oh. And it wouldn't be available, uh, yeah, it doesn't always work to have those uploaded to the public access channel. They wind up uploaded to the website, mm -hmm. and people can stream them from the website, but they can't necessarily watch them on their TVs at home. Right, okay. One other thought I'd like to throw out, and I'm not asking to decide it, just as a think about, is um, another way to make the discussions more accessible is to not have so many of them, and to maybe look at crunching a few, and I, you know, again, work schedules, evening, dine and discuss, whatever you'd want to call it. If we could do a, a good half day or a, or a four to eight or a something sometime where we could cover more in one sitting, it, it takes a day off your calendar and it allows people who want to come and go to hear more all at one night instead of having to come out so many different times. Just a thought. I don't have a date to propose or anything else, but just the thought of having a, a time when really the whole thing is presented as, as, as we've processed demographics, we've processed new programs, to really hear the whole thing in, in one place for four or five hours can, can also be effective. I can say personally that um, I was excited about the opportunity to have the live feed, um, but for my family, Wednesday's awful. <laughs> and so I will go with the will of the board, but I might not be there. <laughs> so, um, as my, as ex and I was tr very excited about this opportunity, but it, Wednesdays are not great for me either. So we may be back to the drawing board on Tuesdays and possibly considering, I think it would be great to think about maybe a consolidation evening. I would like to say that I know the purpose and the goal would be to expand communication with the community around um, budget and process and inform them of our decision. Going into my fourth year of doing this, it's been my experience that when there is an issue that people want to learn more about, they come personally, whether it's a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night. 
and they or in the library or here in the library or here and the fact that um, the use of the email system is is a pretty effective way of voicing their concerns as well um, and, and I'm not sure making the meeting longer would help accommodate that issue either I mean some of these meetings already are four hours long I'm, you know, thinking back to the last time there was a budget meeting on a snowy night not that long ago. Um, I'm wondering if there's just another avenue altogether other than meeting and taping, if there's a perhaps another way of posting the topics and pushing that out or notifying the public about when we're discussing which items for which evenings either through the school newsletters or through the Facebook posts and the parent pages, to sort of exploring options that are more accommodating to not only the schedule of the board, but also maybe offering a different way, which would help, I think, increase visibility. I think that, yeah, uh, oh, go ahead. And I think, uh, you know, we might be trying to solve, find a solution to a problem we don't have. Um, I, I think um, in Cape Elizabeth and through all the budget experiences, it's rarely the case that someone says, you know, they weren't given the opportunity to speak on an item or they weren't aware of, of the agenda. The, the agendas are posted and given um, social media and email as, you know, with, when there are sensitive issues, there's been no lack of of response, so I, I'm not sure that um, whether it's videotaped or live, you know, uh, if someone wants the information, I've yet to have feedback that, you know, that they didn't receive the information they wanted. So um, I, we always look for greater transparent communication. You know, the agenda is posted, um, you know, school board chair answers every email. Um, so. Um, well, I think it's a great idea. I'm just not sure where we might be searching for a problem we, we don't have. Um, so that, that's just my own uh, two cents. In terms of the length of the meetings, um, you know, uh, one feedback we do have is, you know, if you do, you know, uh, go and speak on an item and if you said, oh, the meeting might be five hours long uh, or longer, you know, public. Um, you know, those in the public who want to hear what you're talking about may not last that long. So, um, I, you know, I'm open to ideas, but I think, you know, uh, if two board members can't be there on Wednesday, that's a pretty much easy decision. We should do it on Tuesday. And um, the schedule works well. My one consideration is uh, one of our larger items um, in terms of scheduling is we don't get medical premiums until late in the budget cycle. And as we learned last year, that's new information, surprise, and it, you know, um, so that just might be something we want to continue to remind. Everyone is a big part of it. We may not even know the actual number to later in the budget season. So mm -hmm. um, in summary, given it's late, you know, I'm happy with the schedule. I say we keep it on Tuesday and plug along. I was just going to just add that I think, I think the point that Tuesday is the day that we've all committed to, you know, I think that's a fair enough point. And if two people already cannot make Tuesdays, then that's, that's that as far as I'm concerned. But um, to the point of making sure that we've, you know, put it out there as much as we can, if, it, if it's not already, ask the parent associations each week in their newsletters just to say what's on the agenda this week for the, for the school board workshop. Maybe asking them to include that in their weekly newsletter for, this, for the cycle. So, so yeah. The, the other thing I think may be worth considering is um, having up front a presentation of the entire budget that we might do on a televised Wednesday evening so you can get identify an overview up front that is broadcast live and people can identify their areas of interest and then they can come on to Tuesday where that's going to be discussed. I think we try have tried we do try to do that on a Tuesday. So correct on this calendar 
the challenge of trying. <laughs> so we have tried to have that coincide with our two years now consecutively to have that coincide with our business meeting in February. The experience of our business administrators is that that is too soon. Um, they really need that additional time to finalize numbers. As you indicate, Michael, there are some pieces of information, like potential retirements, that don't become known to us until a little bit later. So having that additional time makes a big difference. So our option, typically we have done the workshop, the workshop in February, which is the fourth Tuesday in February has been when we've done our budget overview presentation. We have the option of doing that presentation on Wednesday the 24th, but again, if, if two board members can't be there, you're weighing the pros and cons. That's what I'm that suggesting. Can we get a television. potentially a one Wednesday early that we could, rather than every Wednesday, every Wednesday, kind of. The you know. other, so just the other idea that I had was um, there are ways to communicate other than on television, so that um, if that we go with our um, Tuesday workshop in February, that we have that, um, that's the usually the overview night, um, and that we have a schedule set by then, I think it would be um, appropriate for there to be a communication from the board, like a district-wide communication that says this is, you know, these this is what's happening. These are when these are the nights when it's going to be discussed, and so I, you know, that could also. Jeff, um, I I'd just like to echo with that. So the first item that we have is the school board finance committee and workshop, sort of the overview. Mm -hmm. You have it for either Tuesday or Wednesday on the Tuesday, but so I, I would. I would lobby for um, consistency if it's going to be every Tuesday and yep. keep them all that way instead of one exception, which I think will we jeopardize losing people that way. And then to also echo what Michael was saying about we don't get the numbers in for our insurance often until late in the game, sometimes even after budget closure. Um, is it feasible or, or even worth the effort to try and move that topic to later in the agenda on some of the scheduled workshops in hopes that maybe that number comes in? I mean, I will say, honestly, we typically don't get that number until April. OK. And the board, that was my question. Uh, we, I think last year was an unusual year um, in that we got it in sort of mid-March. And so we were able to revise numbers before the board took its final I remember that. Final vote, but. Um, revision uh, of the revision. <laughs> Despite lots of lobbying on the part of school districts to um, our health care provider, we, we often don't have visibility on that number until April, and, and so we do our best. We, we usually have a narrower window. Um, as we get closer to that point in the budget cycle, they've given us sort of a, a upper and lower limit on what those increases might look like, and we do our best. I find that fascinating, because they know when we all have to have a budget final well, they Yes, and their formula for determining rate increases has shift, shifted a couple of years ago, and so there have been adjustments that have impacted us since okay. then. But uh, even so, is it worth considering just in case on the outside chance we would have numbers in to shift that later or just deal with a revision of the budget later if that happens to be the case? So the timeline, as you see, gets tight on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, the town council has to adopt, has to have its budget presentation, and then it kind of sits out there for a period of time before mm -hmm. they take their vote, and that has to sit for 30 days before the public is able to vote on it. The requested date from the town council for us to present is April 26th. Know that there is a vacation that <laughs> the week before, um, and so that. We can come a little later in April, and we have taken a vote typically on our budget at our April business meeting, a final vote. The board has adopted that at the, I forget what it will be this year, somewhere around April 12th. So we have a week or two to play with. Well, I'm, I'm merely suggesting to maybe move the staffing and benefits down to maybe the Tuesday, March 22nd meeting, and maybe move some of those topics, swap them out somehow. Well, that, it's the, the scheduling for those presentations is, is often determined in consultation with the finance chair, so I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Who would that be? <laughs> okay. 
I will say that benefits, salaries and benefits are obviously the largest part of the budget, so maybe you can't wait away. too long. Right. It has a major impact. Can we circle back around to, I, I feel like you weren't hoping for us to have extra long meetings, like that was the goal. <laughs> I'd just like to hear more about what the goal around a consolidation afternoon or evening would be, I just, I will, I to will, get my mind around. Yeah, and, and I absolutely respect how budget has happened here for a long time. I happen to have a different experience, which was to spend workshops with some essential questions to start with. What are some impacts of, of uh, demographics mean for us this coming year? To spend a workshop on class size and where principals are proposing maybe there needs to be some staffing amendments and stuff and just spending one night on that and then another night hearing what program proposals might be. An example being, of course, our preschool opportunity for kids who otherwise couldn't attend. Uh, with, a, with a program proposal that, w that could be really talked about in, in that setting. So that by the time you really hear the whole budget presentation, which is the kickoff to this, you've, 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 you've had some foreshadowing of what's going to come. So you hear the whole thing, you push it around a little bit more, and then really um, send the administration back with the suggestions we have. I don't know about this, how about that? And then have a final push we used to do a Saturday. And it would be breakfast and hopefully break by lunch. Then we moved it to a Friday because people didn't want to lose their weekend in the winter. Um, so, so instead of night after night after night after night, it was sort of like intentionally, let's talk about what's up. Let's hear, let's hear what the whole thing looks like. Push back a little and then really sit down and hear the whole X million dollars presentation of how is it looking now after that iteration and what is it we're comfortable bringing to the council. So it just has a little different feel to it. You're addressing the issues that you're trying to um, cover in the front end, hearing the budget that Meredith and her administrative team is putting forth. We send back a bunch of questions, squeeze things a little bit, and then spend just one chunk of time looking at the whole ballgame so it feels coherent. At what point would you imagine um, would public input happen? Any time along okay. that time. And the, and the thing that I used to appreciate about the final overview is um, uh, parents have already had an opportunity to come in and speak, especially they'll come in and talk about when you're looking at class size, impact of staffing, what are principals proposing and so forth, is there support for some of the new program, are programs being evaluated that just started last year, let's get some feedback on that. And so it's no surprise when it finally comes out at the end. And then if there, we always had a couple of counselors who would come and sit in that final four hour stretch and really hear. Uh, and, and what I liked about it is they heard the things that have been talked about and taken off the table. And the things that have been talked about and were clearly of high value to the board that they were pushing th through uh, and, and paying attention to that budget impact. So it gave them a chance to come once and hear the whole thing and learn. So that was the, the benefit, if you will, of, of kind of front-loading the issues of the budget, getting feedback, pushing back, and then just having one last time when you look at the whole thing, instead of five or six different nights. So if I'm understanding right, in some sense, the budget overview is presented at the end of the process after it's been through the some, budget? Of the, some of the major yeah. details and changes. So you have those changes mm -hmm. incorporated into the mm -hmm. full presentation. So you're so up front, you're looking at those big pushers, like Meredith said, the big piece for us is personnel. And and of our 185 teachers, is there a push to go to 188? Is there a place we can go down? Is because of that, are you looking for a literacy coach here or there? Some demographic spreadsheets that are really clear about where staffing lies. That's where a lot, the big conversation comes. And it's a chance to really highlight, no matter where it falls in all of these things, new program proposals. For us, the only thing I'm aware of right now is preschool. And maybe that's it, and that's what we highlight this year. But but through uh, a sort of presentation that shows that, that, that is literally visual and would be online that people could read. We're not asking to do preschool for 85 children. 
you know, this is for, for a specific population, here's the entry points, here's what the cost will be, here's the impact, here's what happens if we don't do it. There's some neat evaluation templates or program proposal templates out there that gets it all in one place, very tight, very tight. And so between your demographics, your program proposals, and then any fixed cost overview, <laughs> that's, that's really your budget, you know? And then you can look at the, at the whole thing in one sitting without beating it to death eight different nights. That's all. So, um, and I don't mean that derogatorily at all. It's just that to, tr to try to make our time and the public's time as efficient as possible to address up front the major pushers, pressures on the budget, and then hear the whole thing after we've given feedback has had some value in my experience. Um, is there opportunity for you to reach out to administration and departments about the, a, a shift in that direction? Well, I would say if the board wants us to make a shift in that direction, we'll do it. It really is your preference, and we're going to need to schedule ourselves accordingly. Okay. I don't have a particular concern. I've worked in lots of different budget models and formats, and we can, we can make it work. Our staffing and benefits night is typically when those program proposals have fit in, in the, historically, because that's when, we're, as Barbara indicates, we're talking about those major pieces. That's why that typically has been at the early part of our presentation. Historically, again, historically here, um, the overview was done at the outset because the biggest concern that I heard going into budget was what's the number looking like as we start this process? And then, you know, the, the programmatic decisions, and not to say right or wrong, I mean, I certainly hear Barbara's point, you know, if you're starting with the programmatic decisions, then that's driving... It's context to the conversation. Exactly. Um, it's driving the future conversation. So I, I, I don't have a particular preference one way or the other. You know, I, I either can work and be successful. I would say the key, again, is informing the public of what your process is going to look like so that people have a chance to provide input and you know, being clear and following that process in, in a regimented way. Not to sound militaristic, but, but you, you want to make sure you're following the steps that you've communicated to people. I guess I'd like to hear from the board. But we don't have to take a vote on this. This is just a decision that we make and then... And it may be too late in the game to mess with it this, this year. Evening, it could be. I just wanted to suggest there are ways that, it, that, that you can sometimes make the time a little more effective, front load it, get to it, you know, and not feel like there's five nights of snatches here and there and circling back and so forth. That's all. But I'm, I'm happy. If we're on Tuesdays, I will be quiet. <laughs> but, but I uh, could actually see the potential of a slight hybrid where there is a very high level overview mm -hmm. and then we go into the contextual mm -hmm. contextual mm -hmm. discussions and then what's different this mm -hmm. year right so yeah. it could be too late this year which I yeah exactly but um, I, I, I I like the idea of really identifying the areas where there are significant differences in drivers because I think that adds to the ability to give a a meaningful narrative to what is in the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the discussion is not only just about the numbers, but also about the, the narrative that goes with that, because that's um, looking at things before, peeling some of that back was sometimes difficult, the way in the prior format. Partly because you had to go back and get the numbers from all before, and you were looking at, you were sort of uncovering the drivers uh, in, the, in the information. I think. So I'm hearing Tuesdays. You're hearing pretty Tuesdays. clearly. I think we have a happy medium, maybe. You know, I think the Tuesday schedule, um, you know, uh, works best. But in terms of suggestions over the sequencing of how the budget is presented, or um, you know, we can do both. If Barbara and other board members have ideas on, you know, how how could we do it differently? Within this schedule, I think we can we can accomplish uh, you know both goals. So I'm not the finance chair, but I imagine if there's suggested changes in the sequencing, 
that Joe would be happy to enter into discussions around that. As a next step, perhaps I could sit with Meredith and we could review some of the comments that we've heard today and maybe come back with a, a counter proposal, what are the three of us? So again, we the, need to post. I mean, in terms of the scheduling of the individual meeting topics, that's fine. As long as we are making the decision tonight that we are holding to a Tuesday schedule, I'm comfortable with that. And then I just want to make sure that like. we communicate with our, I would include our business administrator in that dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, we have community services right now at the outset of the budget process, so the thought was to do that kind of broad overview, then dive into the details of the community services budget and spend the initial workshop on that and then move into um, our other budget topics, but we can make sense. tackle that. And Barbara, I hear you with the presentation of data and making it concise and tight. Uh, you know, if there are existing programs or templates, I would sure. pass them I'll, on. I'll send, them, I'll send a couple along. I, th I think especially for us being aware of the, hmm, both the class size discussion we've had, as well as uh, real curiosity about the preschool piece, having, having those really tightly presented would only be of benefit. Mm -hmm. That was one of the great benefits of our prior workshop discussion on the topic of preschool. Mm -hmm. We heard where the questions were to tighten up our um, presentation for you. And it seems like, if I could just ask on that a second, Meredith, um, we left that, that there was some, there needed to be some thoughtful discussion about identifying kids who might qualify for that. Has, has, any, has that gone anywhere yet? There's been some discussion about that. I don't think that any final determinations have been made okay. at this point. Okay. And so I think we can move on. Okay, so we're moving to the superintendent's report. Okay, I'm gonna give a quick one in the time. Uh, Haves, our Portland Area Technical High School budget will be on our agenda for hopefully adoption in February. At this point, based on the, information, the preliminary information that I've received, it looks like it's a very minor um, increase to the tune of $18.71, and that includes both our um, required payment with respect to our prior enrollment, the, the two prior years of enrollment, as well as the Part 2 costs, which are capital costs for replacement of equipment at PAS. So the recommendation um, for the Part 2 budget was approved by um, the council that oversees the governing board of um, PATHS. And that, um, again, the net result to us is a very mo modest increase of $19. Our calendar draft, someone noted um, prior to the meeting that that isn't included in tonight's agenda. That's correct. That was not intended to be included in tonight's agenda because we, based on our discussion at the last meeting, the board had requested some feedback, um, particularly from elementary parents regarding the early release days. So that survey is, and um, Principal Hassan has left, but that survey is slated to go out soon so that parents have the opportunity to give us some feedback. And again, we welcome any feedback from um, parents regarding our propo proposed calendar. Um, and we hope that we will be able to give you a summary of that feedback so that you're poised to adopt in February, should you be ready to do that, or certainly you could defer that decision to the March meeting. I want to just acknowledge um, students from the middle school and high school, Jojo Zeitlin and Vivian Sullivan, who were winners in the Scholastic Arts Competition of Gold and Silver Keys. Jojo uh, won Gold and Silver Keys for photography work under the with the support of her high school teacher, Richard Roethlisberger. And Vivian Sullivan won two gold keys, was awarded two gold keys for drawing and art, as well as a silver key for digital art. Um, and she worked with uh, middle school art teacher, Marguerite lawler Roner. And while I'm talking about our art teachers, I just wanna acknowledge, he'll join us hopefully in June, but Richard Roethlisberger is retiring this year after many, many years working at Cape Elizabeth High School. And he has certainly been a treasure um, for this community, but he works typically only in the first semester, so he'll be wrapping up his time at the high school next week. 
Normally we get to see him again at graduation and I hope he'll join us for uh, to be recognized in June with other retirees, but just thought I would acknowledge that tonight. We are continuing our search for our special ed director. We reposted that um, opening in December and today actually was the closing date. So I'll be, the board is asked later in the meeting to appoint a representative to that search committee. Once I have that name, we'll be um, sending out information to the people who served last year, giving them the opportunity to kind of re-up that work and then moving that search process forward. We are on the administrative side, busily at work on preparing for the budget season. Again, we have a new business administrator this year, so she's been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to pull all the information together and hopefully put that into a format that will be useful for all of you and that capitalizes on the somewhat cumbersome software that we, <laughs> that we have available to us. Um, the administrative team, um, members of the administrative team met to review the Pond Cove playground proposal. So we anticipate that we will be um, taking a further look at that this spring um, with an eye towards a presentation to the board towards the end of this school year that, that brings forward a kind of comp a more comprehensive playground proposal uh, so that the board has some opportunity to kind of look at that before we move into the upcoming school year and um, plan for any related fundraising that might be necessary for that. I know that um, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, which by the way supported us with the Freshman Academy program that we talked about earlier tonight, has expressed interest in um, potentially providing some support for a playground project. So before we get to that stage, we want to make sure that the board and community, and again, because we don't actually the town owns the school facilities, not the school board. Um, we would want to make sure that both parties have a chance to kind of weigh in on any playground proposal before we move into sort of the fundraising portion of that work. So that's the timeline there. We have our annual student staff and parent surveys on school climate and culture and, and how we're doing. And those will be, that window for those will be opening up next week. So you'll be seeing information from um, your child's school about that. Students will take those surveys at grades five through 12 during the school day. Typically they'll be taken during the advisory period. And next Thursday, the 21st, I'll be facilitating a discussion on the book, How Children Succeed. That's my short list. Thank you. Oh. Moving on to new business, item 7A. May I have a motion, please? Yes. Uh, I move that we approve the high school model UN World Affairs Council trip to Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, February 26 through 28, 2016. Second. Discussion? Recurring this is a yes, thank you. Uh, writing down names at the same time I was trying to speak. So, yes, this is a recurring trip. The World Affairs Council typically goes to Dartmouth Brown um, over the course of the school year. This is their annual trip to Dartmouth, and we always keep an eye on the weather when that trip approaches. For new board members, board policy requires approval from the board for any out of state trips that are more than one night in duration as well as any trips outside of New England. Um, as part of discussion, I'd I just ask, I mean, there's, there's two in a row of these. Are these involving two different sets of kids? Yes, so what happens is typically, and Natalie could probably add to this piece, but she's leaving, so we'll let her do that. Thank you for being here. Um, typically students, different students serve as the primary ambassadors at these different Okay. Different trips. So it allows more kids to participate, That's essentially. Right. Great. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. I guess to piggyback on that one, I move that we approve the high school model UN trip to Boston College, Boston, Massachusetts, March 18th through the 20th, 2016. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Moving on to item 7C. May I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the following policy and procedures for um, adoption 
uh, policy JLF, reporting child abuse and neglect, policy JLFR, suspected child abuse neglect report procedure, and JLFE, suspected child abuse neglect report form. Second. So I think, Barbara, you're the only remaining member of the I'm policy the only committee. remaining member. Not Give us a little <laughs> snapshot. This, this, is, this change was required by law. The law changed. Right. I think I reviewed this briefly at the December meeting, but the law changed to require previously if I had a concern, I as a teacher had a concern about child abuse or neglect, I could pass that concern along to my administrator, and it was then the administrator's obligation to make that report. Now the law has changed so that if I as a teacher have that concern, I can still pass that concern along to you as my, as my administrator, but it's my job to follow up with you to make sure that report was made, and if it wasn't, I have the responsibility to make that report. Right. Is, Is there a time limit? Right. It's within 48 hours. It really tightens the responsibility of the reporter, mm -hmm. and what I like is the format has changed in the report form itself so that the teacher will hear back from the administrator certifying that the report in fact went in. So they're not going to be able to chase the principal or whoever around to make sure it happened. So it really is, hmm. is stepping up the uh, referral procedure to make sure that doesn't go in and out of the ear of a busy principal. So, um, so I'm very much in favor of the board supporting these updates. Excellent. Thank you for that work. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, at this time, I think I have to make my own motion because I know the person who has volunteered to do this. Am I allowed to do that? Certainly. All right. So I move to appoint Susanna Mizell Hubs as board representative to the Special Education Director Search Committee. Second. Thank you. My only comment would be thank you for stepping up. Yeah. You'll be fantastic. Thank you. Same thank you. And so um, I just want to follow up. I, in your communication, you will be reaching out to the... Yes, so my, my intent was to reach out to people who served in this capacity last year. As you remember, we didn't find a permanent candidate um, for this position last year or a permanent nominee for this position. We thought we were able to fill um, this position on an interim basis for the current school year. So I would like to invite those people who previously served to continue with that work. Um, should we have openings after that, that we have particular constituent groups not represented, then we would extend our search more widely. But I, I think it makes sense for these people to continue. Um, the, there hasn't been a large gap in their, of time in their service, and um, I, I think they worked well together, and we had a large group of participants. Great. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 7E, may I have a motion, please? Yes, you may. I move that we approve uh, the following three representatives to the Community Services Advisory Commission. Uh, Trish Brigham and Debbie Butterworth to three-year terms set to expire December 2018 and to appoint Terry Patterson to fill the remainder of her term set to expire December 2017. Second. Discussion. So I'll just share that uh, there were six interested individuals, which was a really happy problem to have. And I reached out to people to gauge their continued interest level. And um, so that is how we came up with these three individuals. And we thank them very much for their service. And hope that the people that maybe had waning interest, think about that again next year as different people move off the commission. So I'll just make one note um, related to that, and um, as I know board members are aware, the town council is currently discussing, and uh, uh, Elizabeth was involved in a conversation um, with the town council chair as well, um, about the future of oversight for community services. The council um, is currently considering taking back oversight for community services, effective kind of July 1 of, of the upcoming fiscal year, um, so that it's, the council kind of weighed in um, through its chair on whether or not the board should move forward with these appointments and the consensus was that that made great sense and that we would look at the council would sort of take over filling terms subsequently 
um, should they ultimately take back oversight for community services. So just so that the board's aware that that conversation and the public is aware that we've had that conversation and these appointments would stand and new positions would be then filled by the council should they take that oversight back. Right. Right. Thank you. All those in favor? Item 7F, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following co-curricular staff nominations um, in the high school, Marguerite lawler Roner to mentor uh, Abigail Woolworth and Tom Cohan to men uh, mentor Senior Senior. All right, second. Any discussion? So I'll just note that mentors are, are part of our um, district plan, but they're also a requirement uh, for the state for new teachers. Um, Abigail is a new teacher who's, who we approved at a prior board meeting who's taking over for our former ceramics teacher, Mary Hart, at the high school. And so she will be with us on a part-time basis. Um, Marguerite has served as a mentor previously. Um, Tom Cohan is a continuing advisor to the senior to senior program. Meredith, are these stipended positions? Yes. Those and those stipend amounts are included in your packet. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I find them, I will get them out. Uh, the mentor stipends are uh, agreed to as a part of our collective bargaining agreement, as are the uh, other stipends based on the hours of commitment. They're in there. No, I know they're in Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Moving on to item 7H. May I have a motion, please? <laughs> what if we don't? Someone has, <laughs> what if we don't a motion? Someone has to do that. I'll, I'll do it. Um, I move that we uh, accept the resignation of Superintendent Meredith Nadeau effective June 30th, 2016. I second. Uh, any discussion, comments? I would just like to say it's with deep regret. Um, certainly the board knows this has been a, a, a bittersweet decision for me as well and you know as I, I shared with the public when I became a finalist for this position um, there is certainly a pull for us to family um, the district in New Hampshire happens to be the district where both my grandmother and great-grandmother graduated from high school which is a unique opportunity um, for for me and um, you know I, I am as I shared in my letter and I'm sure that will become a public document <laughs> um, probably tomorrow but as I shared in my letter this has been a um, wonderful opportunity and the board and teachers and administrators here have so much to be proud of in the work that um, this district does every day and I highlighted in that letter a few of a few of the things that have occurred in the last few years that that I think speak so well for the community support and teamwork that occurs here and as I point out there's still work to do in this district and I know that you know this board and whoever uh, my predecessor is are well poised to continue to move that work forward and uh, uh, again I'll hold a special place in my heart for Cape Elizabeth but right now we've got six more months of work together so no weeping <laughs> moving on so thank you I'd like to share that I think I do speak for the board that we're disappointed that Superintendent Nato is leaving, but grateful for her five years of outstanding service. The board is thankful for all you have helped this district accomplish, not the least of which is the development of a vision, mission, and strategic plan. But we understand the strong pull of family and wish you success as you start a new chapter in your home state of New Hampshire. And for the benefit of the public, the school board will work with the community over the next several months to hire a new superintendent, hopefully for a July 1 start. Community participation and input is, key, is a key component to finding the right fit for CAPE's new school leader. The great news is that we have extensive survey data 
from teachers, administrators, students, and parents from the past year that will be critical to shaping our search. And I want to assure everyone that while this is an important job and a big job, we have the capacity to do this. The board will meet within the week to establish a plan for the selection of our new school leader. And all future communications about this search will come from myself, the school board chair. Thank you, and we wish you the best. Thank you. Any further discussion? No, I would just say that this, um, having recently watched a predecessor assigned while I was still serving out, it gives you a, an interesting opportunity to reflect and be really honest in your departure about growth areas and strength areas, and I really encourage you to do that for us. And as sort of your parting gift, that would be terrific and valuable. Thank you. Yeah, I certainly want to do everything I can to make mm. this a smooth transition for, for the district. Thank you. You have to vote now. All those in favor? <laughs> Grudgingly. <sighs> Thank you. Do we have any committee reports? I think the budget was covered. To say, I think we are kind of fresh off a break. Um, I know that um, we have new members now to the policy committee, so uh, we've been Barbara searching for a new look for new dates. meeting dates and checking with admin. And I'd like to, with your permission, get to my two new committee people, see what their availability is, and feed that back to you, Meredith, to check with the principals. Sure. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Moving on to school board agenda requests. As you know, at any time, you can forward any school board agenda request to myself and the superintendent. I just have one tiny thought. If you went, when they were presenting about Ninth Grade Academy, I was so impressed. Um, my thought was, and perhaps Principal Shedd could speak to it in his next report if that was appropriate, about how we also pay attention to our new students, kids that transition in, brand new to CAPE, trying to make connections with kids and so forth. I, I know from experience how very difficult that can be, and um, I'm guessing knowing him, there's also a program in place, but I'd love to hear a little about it. Thank you. Moving on to announcements of upcoming meetings. So as you know, the board is going to be looking at scheduling a meeting to talk about your search process going forward. We have scheduled a joint workshop with the town council for the evening of February 1st. Um, again, sort of leading into um, the upcoming budget year and the shared work um, that this community does as one town. And the board needs to set a retreat date and Often part of what comes out of that retreat is kind of the workshop calendar for the year. So um, scheduling in topics like transitions and entry for new students um, would be a part of that work as well as the board typically uses that opportunity to set its goals mm -hmm. for the upcoming year. And we have a workshop. We have a workshop at the end of January. and. Um, it may be prudent to discuss whether or not it makes sense for that topic to be more focused around a search process, um, but we can certainly mm -hmm. review that as we get <laughs> through this week. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Joe? Nope. Um, item 11. May I have a motion, please? Oh, I move we adjourn. Second. It was a tough. All those in favor? Oh, no discussion. Drive safely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Well done. Yes.